Chapter 4 in our book is entitled, God is Distinct. We're going to look at the uniqueness of God, the distinctiveness of God, and how he illustrates that in the discontinuity of life. We're going to be talking about things like the created kind, species, and genera, and the classification of life. Let me begin with this issue of God's distinctiveness. What does it mean? Uh, scripture, in fact, claims that there is none like God. There is none like God. I mean, this is hard to emphasize enough. God created everything else. So God is very much different from everything else that exists. There is nothing bigger. There's nothing stronger. Uh, but there's more than that. God isn't just the biggest and the strongest and that sort of thing. He's infinitely bigger and he's completely different in substance. Because he is the one who created, he didn't have an origin, he is so different, so distinct, so unique from everything else that it, it cannot be emphasized enough. To understand that characteristic of God, though, it's one of those characteristics that is invisible, like everything else in God. Although he is distinct, he, is, he cannot be seen in that distinction, in that uniqueness. <clears throat> so God has chosen to illustrate his distinction, his uniqueness, his distinctiveness by putting biological discontinuity into the biological world. And one of the places where this is seen is in what's called the biblical kind. So we're going to look at that for a moment here. In uh, Genesis chapter 1, we have this phrase translated after its kind or after his kind or after their kind used 10 times in the biblical text. 10 times. It's one of those things where if God says something once, you should pay attention. If says something twice, you really should pay attention. Three times, surely you shouldn't ignore this. He says this 10 times. Something important about this thing called kind. It's kind. For example, he says in Genesis 1, 11 and 12, let the earth bring forth the fruit tree after its kind. The earth brought forth herbs after their kind. It brought forth trees after their kind. In verse 21, it says, God created every living creature which the waters brought forth after their kind, and every winged fowl in the air after his kind. And then in the next day of creation, verse 24, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, the beasts of the earth after his kind. God made the beasts of the earth after his kind. I'm sorry if this sounds a bit repetitive, but I'm reading what, the, <laughs> what, what God put into his, his, the first chapter of the Bible. Created cattle after his kind, creeping things that creep upon the earth after his kind. He says this is ten times. Must be something very significant here. He picks up the theme again when it comes to the flood. Uh, he says to, uh, to Noah, every living thing, you are to bring onto the ark of the fowls after their kind, of everything on the earth after his kind. And then at the end of the flood, it says every beast, every creeping thing, every fowl after their kinds went out of the ark. So it's something mentioned in the creation account. It's something mentioned in the, uh, in, in the flood account. What is this thing? The the kind, this biblical kind. The word that is translated kind in the English text is the Hebrew word mean. Linguistically, that Hebrew word, which is translated kind, could mean just like various. God created birds after their kind might mean he created various birds. And I'll leave it at that. Except that there's something about the use of this Ten times, use of it in the flood account, and then again uses it in describing the things we're supposed to eat and not eat, that suggests that, um, that it's a little more specific than this, that it isn't just a bunch of different ones. 
it is a, it's referring to a specific grouping of things. It's used in the food laws, it's used in the flood. It suggests that mean, that Hebrew word, has a biological meaning, not just a bunch of things, but a special biological group of things. Looking a little more closely, we see that the Hebrew word used throughout the Bible is used only of organisms. It only refers to organisms. So you could have various buildings or various stars, but it's never used with them. It's only used with organisms, which suggests that mean has something to do with organisms and organisms alone. It says in the flood account that you're supposed to take two or seven of every kind onto the ark. This suggests that kind is a bigger grouping than just one. It's at least two, and in some cases at least seven. It's a group of organisms uh, that is being referred to. The other thing is that on the day that Adam was created, God brought the animals and the animals of the land and the birds of the sky to Adam to see what he would name them. And in the process of that first day of Adam's existence, he named all the animals and birds of the garden. That suggests he did this rather rapidly. That suggests that each, in the, in the case of every animal, every bird that was brought to him, he came to an idea of, an, of a name very quickly, suggesting that there's something about the organism that allows a human to uh, sort of intuitively recognize that created kind. It suggests that maybe God created our brains in such a way that we automatically recognize these things called created kinds, and He creates organisms in the form of created kinds in such a way that we would actually be able to name them, recognize them as kinds. So there may be a, uh, something intuitive about, to humans, about the classification, about these groups of organisms. It also says in that account that God brought these animals to Adam to see what Adam would name them. And whatever Adam gave, whatever name Adam gave to them, that became the name thereof. That suggests that Adam was able to identify this group of things being sufficiently similar that he'd give them the same name, and they're sufficiently different from other things that he could easily distinguish them from other things. And not just him, but apparently everybody afterwards, because that became the name thereof. So it suggests that there is, whatever a kind is, there's similarity within the group that unites them, that allows people to recognize them as a group, and dissimilarity between that group and everything else, what we'd call discontinuity between that group and other groups, so that you can easily distinguish that group from any other. Also the claim that whatever that name that Adam gave it was, that became the name from then on, which suggests that the group later still looks the same. It persists through time. People keep naming it the same name because it hasn't changed. It is, in fact, unchanged through time. It's persistent. Also, when you think about then what that adds up to, if each of the kinds, when they are created, are distinct from each other, and the kinds don't change as time goes on, then the kinds remain separate through time. They remain distinct from each other. They always are distinct from other kinds, whatever that is. Also, there's a command at the end of the creation account that all of the animals, the birds, so on, are to reproduce and fill the earth. And since that suggests that there's going to be a certain number that are created and then the number is increased through time, till they fill the earth, it must be, if kinds persist through time, that you must be able to fill a kind, a group of organisms, with a bunch more of them. They must be able to reproduce within the kind and remain part of the kind. 
that whatever the ancestors, whatever the original group of organisms were in a kind, they're producing young that are also of the same kind. And so kinds reproduce themselves through time in that fashion. So we can kind of put all this stuff together and, and create a definition of the biblical kind. It is a recognizable group of similar organisms surrounded by, we're going to call it deep discontinuity, meaning there's a, there's a difference between that group and everything else. There's, a, there's an area around that group where nothing is similar to it. There's a, there's a gap, uh, a, a, a difference in appearance between that group and every other. And that gap can't be crossed. Organisms don't change to go from one group to another group. They stay within their kind. They don't change into another kind. So it's a discontinuity or a difference between that group and everything else. And it's deep, meaning you can't cross that. Organisms can't change across it. Organisms can't reproduce across it. Organisms are, are, remain within their created kinds and don't move outside of them. So it's a recognizable group of similar organisms surrounded by deep discontinuity. And that group persists through time by members interbreeding with other members of the same kind producing similar offspring. So this can be an official definition of our created kind. This is something you could, could have deduced by studying the Bible without knowing much, of all, much at all about organisms about us. And it's, this is the definition we're going to use in, uh, in looking at, evaluating the thing we call the biblical kind.